Good day, Patrick. You have a lot more interesting background than me. You've, you've moved to this, my, this is my amazing office, my little closet at the end of the hall. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, we're all finding a way to get it done. Uh, obviously, <laughs> casual Thursday for me. But uh, let's I jump around. I wore, I wore a collared shirt. I was sitting outside last week. I had a collared shirt and a jacket on. That's just a sweater tonight. Today. Yeah, well, hopefully once we get a little bit warmer weather, the avocado shirt will come back. They, yeah, exactly. So we can appeal to the, those millennials, those darn exactly. kids. Um, let's, let's, speaking of those darn kids, let's talk about the Canucks. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I get a kind of, I, as, as an old timer now, I get a kind of a kick to the reaction. Um, start of the year, everyone's like, oh my God, what's going on? This team is right. terrible. They beat what everyone knew going into the into the Ottawa series. Everyone knew going into the season, Ottawa was absolutely dreadful. They beat right. Ottawa. Everyone's like, "What was everyone panicking about?" This is the these are the real Canucks. Now we're back in panic mode. Like, yeah. I, none of this surprises me. They're not as bad as people were making them out. They're not as good as people were making yeah. them out when they beat Ottawa. How do you see it? I think it's exactly that. And I, you know, I've been working on this quarter poll story, which you know I think will be up probably by the time this video is up. We'll see. Maybe this weekend. Um, and you look at where the Canucks sat when the season stopped and, you know, they had some really, they had, you know, had a pretty good start to the year. They had actually, I mean, we remember those terrible losses in Florida, but January was actually really good. They were eight and three in January last year, maybe a bit of luck, obviously a lot of Markstrom. Um, but February and March, they kind of sank in terms of those two months, they were seven, nine and two. They sank, you know, they were just sinking and that's just kind of treading water and, they were in on the bubble, you know, depending on how you counted. Uh, they were either seventh or they were ninth. And, you know, they weren't a certainty to make the playoffs at the end of the season last year. And this is essentially the same team. Uh, perhaps, you know, I think not as good in goal, obviously. Maybe a little better on defense, just in, at least on paper. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just because Nate Schmidt, I think, is just a better presence than Chris Tanev is at this point in his career uh, and you know about the same and up forward and uh, although you know Niels Hoglander obviously has made a difference there but you know it's not like this is a slam dunk better team than last year's team and last year's team was okay and had some fun moments and you know could score goals had a good offense but they they weren't great on defense and they had a really good goalie and they don't have a really good goalie to so far this season and that's the difference, I think, more than anything. So, yeah, it's exactly as you said. They're they're definitely not uh, as good as Calgary or Toronto or or Montreal. Um, they're better than Ottawa. They're in the uh, in the range with uh, you know kind of Edmonton and, and Winnipeg, and they're in a fight for fourth place. And they're not in a great spot right now. They've got to they've got to play some pretty good hockey over the next uh, over the next forty some games to close out the season, which seems crazy. But, you know, if you do the math, this is the quarter poll. This would be 20 games into the season uh, in, in a regular year, which is American Thanksgiving, give or take. And if they were sitting where they are at American Thanksgiving, which right now is realistically out of the playoffs, um, you'd say it's touch and go for them to make the playoffs. And it all kind of makes sense. So pretty much business as usual then. Um, yeah. but when you look at it, you talk about the goalie, obviously. And uh, this again, this is what kind of puzzled me is, uh, people flipping out about losing some of these games. And we know over the last two seasons, we'd seen the Jacob Markstrom 40 save nights. Uh, you know, you get a couple of, you could get a couple of magic moments from Pedersen and, and, or Miller, uh, and Markstrom shuts the door and mm -hmm. Hey, this is, they were finding points that way. Maybe you can make the argument there. Well, you can make the argument that they're, they're not doing that so far this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, and I don't think you can say Holtby's been bad, but do you see a team that, as they move forward now, I have no doubt that the you know their elite players are going to find their stride at some point, that Demko is just given like, you're the guy, and let him go. And if they get, right. not Markstrom level, but if they get good goaltending, they are going to be in the mix for the playoff hunt. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. That um, You know, you're right. Holpe's been fine. You know, he, he be better than fine with that defense. Yeah, no, you that's that's the story. I mean, to me, that is the entire story. Uh, you'd like their defense to be better. You want to think that, you know, like I said, the influence of Nate Schmidt in terms of his two way game, 
you know, he has been better. He actually has, he had a, maybe not a great start, but of all the Canucks defensemen, he's actually been their best defenseman, um, both in terms of, I think, when you watch the game and just by the numbers. Quinn Hughes has been shockingly bad. And I think he, he didn't say it, he would never admit to it. But, you know, I think there was a suspicion early in the year that he was dealing with an injury. Um, he says he's now 100%. He said he was, quote, sore uh, earlier in the year. So, you know, for the whatever that means. But, you know, at the end of the day, they still, it's a structural problem. You know, the fact that the lotto line has been so poor in, in their two-way game, compared, especially compared to last year, uh, is, is shocking. And so, you know, it is, it is one of those ones. They, they need more than anything. They need, they're going to need really great goaltending. And um, for the most part, they haven't gotten that yet. So, I mean, they'll, they're this, you know, assuming that people are not watching this all on, on Thursday afternoon when we're recording it and, and there is some longevity for this for the weekend, we'll see how they are against the Leafs. So they haven't played yet, but what's your thoughts on this division? Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned that you think they're in that mix. I mean, yeah, absolutely. The, the Montreal situation we'll get into in a second, Montreal and Toronto, you have to say talent wise is above them, but beyond that, I mean, Calgary hasn't looked great. We know Edmonton has, some tremendous highs, but some tremendous lows as well. And as you mentioned, Winnipeg might be the one team that you're sort of looking at almost on par with that they'll have to outfence the rest of the way. Yeah. I mean, I think Calgary, you know, obviously with the Sam Bennett situation are in a weird spot. I think, um, I think they're still trying to suss out what their lineup really looks like. Uh, the fact that, um, They've only played, I mean, it sounds funny to say, they've only played nine games, which to be clear is four fewer than the Canucks. Um, and, you know, it, it. I think Calgary all of a sudden is going to find itself in a better spot. They're still sitting behind the Oilers if they say they win their game in hand. Uh, well, they're for, you know, they have, they have a game in hand on, on the Jets, the Leafs, and the, the Habs. Say Calgary wins that. They're still not in the playoff mix. Um, but the fact that they have only given up 23 goals this year, which you know obviously is half the number the Canucks have given up, um, you know, and even in four four games, that's not enough to make the difference up. It's kind of striking uh, how stout the Flames have been defensively. The question for them is, can they get their offense going? Uh, you know, Chris Tanev clearly has been a strong influence on there. I think Johnny Gaudreau said the other day that. Uh, Jacob Markstrom has been their best player and that's good, but a team like Calgary doesn't want their goalie to be the best player. They want Johnny Gaudreau to be the best player. Um, and, and so kind that's you know, like their best player though. What's that? Kind of paid him like their best player. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. Um, but you know, they need, they need their offense to find another gear. Uh, yeah. And that was always an issue there. You know, it is, it is, I, I think in the long run, I do think Calgary are going to be, you know, I think they're the third best team in this division. I think that's how it shakes out and that it becomes a three-way battle between the Jets, the Canucks, and the Oilers um, with one of them really needs, needing to seize the day. And I think, you know, the Jets will see how things play out once they get um, purely Dubois in the lineup, which I guess is going to be, you know, you know, next week, yeah, next week, right? Um You know, that that's just kind of reality. I, I, I The Jets still aren't great defensively. The Canucks played really well against them last Saturday. That was a surprisingly even matchup. I, mean, I don't know if maybe surprising is the wrong word, but it was given where things had been, it was a surprisingly tight matchup. The Canucks played pretty well. The Canucks actually played not bad on Tuesday. You know, they they were not necessarily unlucky to lose, but they, they played actually all right. They didn't get a couple bounces, but you know what? They need more than that. They, they need more than just, well, you know, they, they were in the game. They need to win some games. And the real challenge for them, it's just simply math. It's just the fact that they've only got 40 some games left. They're going to have to play something like 600 hockey to close the season. And to date they've been sub 500 and that's, you know, it's not a switch. You can just flip and say, all of a sudden we're a, one of the better teams in the division versus one of the middling teams in the division. Okay. So we'll finish on this note. Uh, we have to talk about Ben Kuzma's interview and it's yeah. interesting that you brought up Sam Bennett because, mm-hmm. you know, I've seen the, uh, well, Bennett for Vertanen swap uh, mooted uh, in social media by fans. Sure. You know, you have to look at the general manager position and what faith you have for him to pull off something uh, changing in, a, in a, what was once a valued asset, which is now shrinking. Right. Um, obviously, you know, everyone everyone sees the issues with Jake Vertanen, and then you deal with the border and the quarantine and how quickly you need help. Yeah. And, 
are you fighting for your job or not? You know, I, I have some sympathy for Jim Benning in that we complain in media all the time that uh, no one ever says anything. Yeah. And ben, rightly so, asked him about Tyler Toffoli, who has just lit them up. And it's mm -hmm. an obvious question. Credit to Jim for answering it. I think we know what he meant by he said, I ran out of time. Uh, needed to move money. The owners have been clear they're not going to spend dead money. Yeah. So there's no buyouts. Uh, you got to move something out to bring something in. And they wanted to fully, but they didn't get them done. And maybe that's his old contracts that are hanging around his neck. Yeah. But what does this mean for the Canucks front office? Well, I think it's going to be a big picture question. And I think you nailed it right there that it's not so much that he couldn't even make moves in the moment, which was true. It was, there were constrictions put on what they were able to do. Part of the reason why they were able to even pursue Oliver Ekman Larson at all was because most of his salary had been paid for the season. And that's just the matter of the fact. Um, the, the, the reality is, is that at the end of the day, at the end of the season, you know, or I suppose something happens before that, but I have a hard time imagining that. Um, at the end, you know, at the end of the season, you're going to sit back and say, "What's the overall picture?" Sure, there's been some young, good players added to this lineup, and that's important. Uh, but the reason, you know, one of the key reasons why they weren't able to keep Tyler Toffoli, why they weren't able to re-sign Jacob Markstrom, and to be clear, I think they made the right decision because the mo money that Markstrom is getting from Calgary, you know, it's a big bet from them that he's going to be delivered on that. And we already know about making big bets on older players, and Louis Erickson is part of the reason why they couldn't retain Tyler Toffoli is that they've made a commitment to a player who was, I think, had the second-best shooting percentage of his career the season before he signed the contract here, who was kind of a second choice after they didn't get Milan Lucic because they wanted, you know, basically ownership said, I want, we want to make a splash. We want to say, this is what we're doing. We're not rebuilding. We're carrying on with this notion that we can retool on the fly. And, you know, in the end, it's not just, I mean, it isn't just Louis Erickson. It's the decision to retain Sven Berchi. Like Sven Berchi, a guy they signed a three-year contract and within a year decided, well, we don't really want this guy anymore. Like, how does that happen? Michael Furlan. Michael Furlan right out of the box. It was the same History. story. You go further back. Same story with a guy like Sam Gagne or Eric Branson, players that I think everyone sort of looked and said, why, you know, they don't, they either don't fit or they're just not good enough. Um, you know, why are you making these commitments to these players and then trying to find ways to dig out of your hole? It's, it's this sort of old way, old NHL way of thinking that, well, someone will take them. We don't have to worry about the contract but you do the contract's everything salary salary cap is everything and guys all guides all your decisions now and at the end of the day that's been a big challenge for this team time and again and you know it's going to be a, i think a huge factor in in assessing uh the the work of jim benning over the seven years that he's been here in vancouver i think one thing we can be sure of though is that this you don't expect any big changes during the season but after the season it may be it may be d-day I never say never, but you know, I think more than likely just the cost of what yes. that all means and when you're not selling tickets. Especially when you're not selling tickets. Okay, Patrick, well guess what? We ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we'll, see, we'll see how they we'll see how the team is against the Leafs and we'll regroup with yeah. this next week. All right, take care.